everyone. On today's episode of the Security Swarm Podcast, I've got a good friend of mine, Paul Schnackenberg, on the show. And today we're going to be asking the question, as a platform, is Microsoft 365 secure? Now, this is a question I've heard come up in the community a lot of times. So Paul and I spend a lot of time talking about this question, the ins and outs of it, and we come up with some interesting insights. All this coming up next on the Security Swarm Podcast. Hey everyone, welcome back for another episode of the Security Swarm podcast, the podcast from Hornet Security that brings you the knowledge and insights straight from the security lab, again, right here at Hornet Security. As always, I'm your host, Andy Sirwich, and with me, I have a good friend of mine today. I got Paul Schneckenberg. How's it going, Paul? I'm pretty good, Andy. How are you? Doing good, doing good. I'm happy I've got you on uh, the show today. You know, ever since we started this particular podcast, I've wanted to get you in front of the camera to, to talk about 365, and we've got a pretty good topic to talk about today. But so before we get into that, I know this is your first time appearing on this particular show. So for those listeners and or viewers, if you're watching video, can you give us a little bit of background about who you are? Sure. So I've been in IT for uh, nigh on 30 years now. Um, I'm running my own business here in Australia for 25 years or so. Uh, I'm a part-time teacher. I'm a Microsoft certified trainer. And uh, and uh, yeah, I do a lot of IT stuff around the place. And nowadays, of course, a lot of IT security related stuff. So yeah, that's me. You put it perfectly. You do a lot of IT related stuff. Definitely. I would agree with that. <laughs> so, well, you know, we picked a doozy of a topic today here. Um, and it, it's going to be an interesting discussion because I think this is a question that a lot of people in the industry have, especially when they are either in the process of migrating to a new uh, cloud platform or uh, they've been using it for a while and they're starting to ask questions and maybe they're being audited. There's a lot of reasons why this particular question could, co could come up. And I'm going to stop being cryptic now and actually say what the question is. And, and that is <laughs> today we're examining the question of as a platform, is Microsoft 365 secure, right? That's just kind of the question we're, we're looking at here. And you know, I guess I'm just going to start this episode with posing that as a general question. Um, yeah. Is M365 as a platform secure? And, and before I, I give my answer, uh, I'll, you know, give the floor to you first, Paul. So what do you think? Thanks, Andy. Yeah, look, um, first of all, because we're going to talk about some of the not so secure things that we have issues with. But I want to start with saying yes. Microsoft 365 as a platform is a secure platform. Microsoft spends an awful lot of money and an awful lot of energy and an awful lot of people to make sure that that's the case. So looking at any small and medium business and even most larger businesses, are they more secure if they picked up everything that they were doing on-prem that is Microsoft 365 related and they put it in the cloud into Microsoft 365? Yes. No doubt about it. So, so that's right. the bottom line. As a platform, yes, it is more secure than what you have on premises. However, I would point out that secure is always a gradient. It is not a binary state. So you cannot say that it's a secure platform because like everything made by humans, it has flaws and it is not secure as in i never have to worry about anything ever and it will always be perfectly secure but uh it is more secure so on the spectrum right. on the gradient it's definitely more secure now let's see what you have to say you know i i'm spot on with that you know and when i think about the platform itself you know i always approach this stuff from the perspective of an infrastructure engineer because i spent a large chunk of my career as an infrastructure engineer right so you know, I know that under the hood, 365 consists of thousands upon thousands upon thousands of servers, switches, storage, and all of that other stuff inside of the various data centers, right? And I think Microsoft has done a fantastic job of providing a secure platform at that level, right? Now, yeah, no doubt about it. There's some concern about lack of transparency, which we'll get into. But as far as I know, as far as the industry knows, 
There are no concerns in that area that I'm aware of. Now, that said, you know, there are some areas uh, that we can get into. And I, before I move on to that, um, I do want to say I totally agree with your points about, you know, if somebody's moving from on-premises into 365, it is by far way and above more secure than what they had on-premises. Definitely no questions asked about that. Um, I mean... (laughs) You know, let's look at just Exchange Server, just Exchange Server by itself. How many, you know, CVEs have there been for Exchange Server in the last 12 months? Uh, Last I Mm -hmm. counted, it was 11 or 12 serious CVEs. Um, I think there were some in the 8 to 9 CVSS score range, if I remember correctly. Um, Some that are still being actively, um, you know, targeted in the wild. So... Yeah, I uh, get the heck off of Exchange Server, right? And if I'm <laughs> again put my engineer hat back on, I don't want to manage Exchange Server anyway. So again, that's a whole different discussion. So I think generally, like I said, at the infrastructure layer, I definitely think it's secure, and um, you know, I think it's more secure than on-premises. But there are still some caveats, which that's what we're talking about in this episode, right? So I, I think. A good place for us to start when we're talking about caveats, and this is something that you brought up when we were kind of talking through the the preparation for this episode, right, is that when we look at the sheer number of portals and the sheer number of configuration options and the configuration creep that we've had in 365 as a platform and all of its associated services, because it's not just 365, right? You've got Azure AD in the mix. You might have uh, Intune, Config Manager. I mean, depending on the services you're using, like you said, there's thousands and thousands of configuration options, right? Which creates a problem. And I know you wanted to talk about that as part of this episode. So I think that's that's a good time to get into that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's one of the big things. Um, I have this philosophy or this way I see software in the industry, right? We, we started with on-premises software many years ago, and now we're in the cloud and you have SaaS services, and I as I'm past, but here we're talking about SaaS services. And it's, it's interesting to see that very often you will have a small business-focused piece of software of some kind that then tries to, as it becomes popular, tries to scale up to become more enterprisey. And then you have the enterprises piece of software that tries to scale down to make it easier to configure so that it'll work better for small businesses, right? right? And I think right. Microsoft 365, Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, all of the other workloads is definitely in that latter camp, right? And they sort of assume right, that there is a, uh, a a team of IT people behind the scenes who understands all the configuration, who keeps up with all the changes, and who configures it correctly. And in some cases, that's correct. But in many, many, many businesses, that's just not how they right. operate. And even when there is an IT team, right, small, medium business, large business might have an IT team, that IT team, in many cases, was used to, hey, we upgraded to the new version. Now we don't basically need to do anything for the next three years. We can learn about all the settings before we deploy the thing, and then we have a big project, and then we deploy the thing. Now there's new settings every week. I think that is one of the problems. The other problem is that because there are so many interacting workloads, you know, like there's not just, you just don't have like these are our exchange service and these are our SharePoint service. You have, this is Microsoft 365 with dozens and dozens of different workloads, dozens and dozens of portals by now, and lots right. and lots of places to do configuration. And the problem is that uh, complexity is the enemy of security. The more complex a system is, the harder it is to secure. And I think that's one of the big problems because there are so many places to set security settings. There are so many interactions between those security settings that are not necessarily obvious. Microsoft does a good job with their learning material. They do a good job with the documentation material. That's true. But it's a lot and it changes on a fairly frequent basis. Microsoft has done some inroads here. Um, and what comes to mind is Azure AD security defaults. So if you just turn that on, you get a baseline of settings that that locks your tenant down quite well. Great for small businesses that 
don't need conditional access policies and don't need um, break glass accounts for their administrators. But other than that, uh, you know, like a medium to large business is going to find it very hard to turn on security defaults as a, right. hey, this just solves a lot of your issues and you don't need to go and configure stuff. So it's hard. It's it, it's hard. And yeah, that's why we see breaches because there's so many complex interactions between all these settings. Definitely. That's a good point. And I mean, I, I've been saying this about Microsoft for years. I mean, don't get me wrong. They make amazing products. I mean, I'm a Microsoft MVP, so obviously <laughs> I love their product set, right? But what I found working with Microsoft over the last uh, however long now um, is when they design a new feature, you can tell it is usually with the mega corporations in mind, right? So I'm going to use, um, you know, uh, DLP in 365 as an example. The DLP capabilities in 365 are amazing, right? But to use them properly, you need to have at least a DLP person, at least. Yep. And depending yep. on the size of your organization, you may need a DLP team to manage that, right? Probably a sub team of your uh, compliance team or something, right? Yeah, and exactly. You mentioned those those uh, you know small to medium businesses. They're going to look at a feature like DLP and all the pages and pages of configuration options, and they're going to be like, uh, I have no idea what to do with this, you know, and. Yep. You know, there are those IT people out there, to their credit, they'll look at the documentation and they will end up making it work, but they've got other priorities going on, right? You know, this yeah. machine over here is blown up and needs to be rebuilt. This server is having problems and needs to be patched. You know, I mean, yeah, so like you said, you know, complexity is not great when it comes to security. So that's definitely... Um, a check in the not secure column, <laughs> I guess, right? So, yeah, and I suppose as a bit of a shameless plug here, um, the self promotion here. I mean, we do have a book that is available, a free ebook that has a checklist do. with a whole bunch of things that you can go through uh, that will help you at least tick some of those boxes, if not all of them. So, um, so that's an option for you to download. That's a Link fantastic below. segue. Yes, I will be sure to get that into the episode description. That's a great resource. If I remember right, that clocked in it. I don't know, like a hundred pages or something like that, wasn't it, Paul? Was that the hundred yeah, page yeah. one? And you got a downloadable Excel spreadsheet with the actual yeah. checklist available mm. as well. You can customize That's that right. to your heart's content and go for it. Yep, yeah, and it's completely free. Yeah, fantastic resource. So I'll be sure to share that in the uh, in the show notes. So, with that, whenever I think about the security of three sixty five, you know. Um, again, putting my system engineer hat back on, looking at it from the perspective of the infrastructure engineer or the sysadmin, I think about how end users utilize 365 on a day-to-day -day basis, right? And um, I guess I would say when it comes to the sharing of data in 365, our end users have, how would I put it? I would say they've become accustomed to a certain standard of living when it comes to sharing, right? So, I mean, you think about the yeah. default share settings in a new tenant in 365. Uh, your average user can share this with this person, this with this person. Uh, every Everybody gets a shared file, right? You know, and yeah. that creates a governance headache for your IT team. So, I mean, yeah, there's ways of locking it down and trying to wrap your hands around it. Um, but again, when we start having that discussion of mega enterprise versus small to medium business, maybe smaller enterprise organizations, I'm thinking like sub 2000 employee companies, right? I mean, this becomes a problem and it, it brings yeah. into question that longstanding argument of ease of use versus security, right? I mean, there's, mm -hmm. there's an argument to be made that sharing is helpful and I, I'm going to be the first to admit, I love the sharing capabilities in 365. It's amazing, but it needs to be governed and used properly. But I would yep. say it's kind of a gray area in terms of security. What do you think, Paul? 
Yeah, completely. I you couldn't have I, I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, I think the 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 pe the thing people need to realize here by default, if you are in an organization, you haven't changed any of the defaults, and you um, add an external user to a team, for instance, they now have access to the shared documents in that team, and that is not necessarily obvious, right? The end user, right. the internal user is doing that share may not think of that. The other thing that's also default, unless it's changed in the last week, it's hard to keep up, is that that it external is. user can share that with somebody else externally, right? So they can share the access with somebody else externally. And not only is that an issue if you don't want those people to have access to whatever documents is in your teams, for instance, as an example, but it also means that you now have accounts created in your Azure Active Directory, guest accounts that are sitting around. And often all you have for these accounts is an email address. You don't have a name, you don't have necessarily, right? I mean, the user could, the external user could go in and add those things, but they probably don't. You don't have a picture. You you don't know anything about them. And so I know a lot of larger organizations, they have a sponsorship uh, system where you can't just share with somebody externally. You've got to invite them first, right? fill in a form and give that information so that we know which company they're from. We know what team they're part of, of collaborating with, what project, how long we think they should have that access, right? Because... Right. Uh, and and when you have that information, it's much easier to govern the access, right? And time limited, et cetera. Now, I do want to mention Microsoft does have a good feature. If you've got the right licensing called access reviews, right? Where you can say, um, you can approach the team leader in a project and say, hey, these are the people that have access to this team. And then every quarter or every month or every six month, whatever, you run an access review. They get an email saying, these are the 25 people that have access. Should they still have access, right? And then they have to say yes or no to those people. And you can set it up so that if they don't get a yes, they automatically get kicked off. So, But that's sort of governance after the fact. It's sort of cleaning up the mess you made in the first place right. rather than not creating a mess in the first place. Um, and I did also want to mention when you're talking about sharing in general, like this is not like you could talk to an IT person from 10 or 15 years ago and they might go, oh, we won't allow that. We just won't allow that. That's just stop it. That's what well, you don't. You can't have that. No, no, absolutely not. And just turn it off. Right. And you can go into Microsoft 365 and you can drag the sliders down and it's like, no, nope, no sharing externally, for example. But the problem is all you've done now is you've forced your users to share in another channel. Because they're going to go, oh, I can't share in Teams, can't share in SharePoint, can't share in OneDrive for Business. Fine. Oh, you're stopping me in email as well? No problem. I've got my personal Gmail. I've got my Google Drive or my whatever drive, right? Dropbox, Box, whatever. Oh, I'll share yes. it there. <laughs> that so creates a think... whole other option, a whole other uh, problem. Uh, it does, right? And that's what we need to realize because, again, 15 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, the users didn't have an option. There wasn't a Dropbox, or at least like, you know, like an IT savvy person could have set up an FTP server or something. But like for most ordinary users, they didn't have an option. So if IT told them no, that, that it was a no. Today, that is not the case. IT yep. tells them no, you're just going to find another way. And there are millions of ways available and none of them are good to have your corporate data in. So, so don't think that you can sort of put this genie back in the bottle. What you've got to do is work with the business to have a good governance around that because this is a people problem. It's not really a technology problem. Definitely, definitely. You know, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the, you know, right-sizing permissions after the fact as well too. Uh, we actually have a new service coming out at Hornet Security called Permissions Manager that will allow organizations to um, get reports, right size permissions, not just for SharePoint, but for OneDrive for business as well. And, um, you know, I think one of the driving reasons behind kind of why we developed this was kind of to our point earlier, in order to facilitate that function natively in 365, you're going to like six or seven different spots across several different screens and portals. Uh, we just said, here's a single pane of glass and we do it all from a single interface. So um, I'm excited for that to come out um, 
That comes out soon, I know. I, I can't give a specific date, but I know it's soon <laughs> as of the time of this recording. So hopefully, fingers crossed, by the time this episode comes out, it'll be available, right? And if it is, it'll be in the show notes. So again, another um, <laughs> shameless self-plug, right? <laughs> so, well, with that, um, you know... I think this is a good segue to you. We're talking about how end users are going to use outside services to share and we lose visibility, right? So it kind of makes me think about transparency, which kind of lines up with our, our next talking points. And what do we think about software and security of software? You know, we've got CVEs out there, right? That are used for disclosing critical vulnerabilities. I mean, that's the whole point of a CVE, right? And we hear about them almost week. Well, I think we do hear about them weekly now, right? Um, I, you know, one for Exchange here, uh, one for, well, you hear about them for everything. Um, and the one thing that kind of sticks out to me do you ever hear about CVEs for Azure AD or? Microsoft 365 or AWS or Google Compute Engine or any of these public cloud services, you don't. No. And I no. I think yeah. that lack of transparency is a problem, right? I get yep. why those organizations can get away with that because, well, it's a vulnerability in our infrastructure and we're not required to disclose that information, but like, how many millions of people are utilizing these services, right? Uh, and and are there mitigations that could be made? Sure, because we don't control the infrastructure. It's not like we can patch it ourselves if we want to. But if there's a known mitigation that we could put in play on you know, the configuration side, I would want to know about it. But I, to me, that's a problem. What do you, what do you think, Paul? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think this is a big one. And I think this is something that we've seen over the years. So we could spend the whole podcast, <laughs> multiple podcasts on the whole sort of history of responsible disclosure. And right. 20 years ago, you went to a vendor and you said, hey, there is a bug in your software. And they'd be like, yeah, go away. <laughs> <laughs> or they'd be like, yeah, well, we were not going to tell anyone, so it's fine, right? Like the, the whole thing has changed dramatically over the last couple of decades. And it's the pendulum is swinging back and forth, right? Now, the main issue I have, which is exactly how you described it is, right, that if you buy a piece of software and install it on a server on-prem, at least from any of the major vendors, and it has a problem in it that gets discovered by a third-party security researcher, they responsibly report it, it will be assigned a CV. Uh, so it's a tracking number. It will, if, in case our right. listeners don't know what a CV is, um, it will also be assigned a CVSS, right? How easy it is to exploit because something that has a CVSS of seven is much harder to exploit that, than something that has a CVS of, CVSS of 9.5 or something, right? So that gives you some idea of how to prioritize. Um, I've read some papers around the fact that this isn't a, a, a perfect scoring system and there are some issues around it, but it's better than nothing. Right. But you don't get any of that for cloud software, right? You're just asked to basically trust the vendor. And I think that's a problem. Um, and I think that transparency is something that should be regulated. And um, with the smooth operation of U.S. politics, where most of these companies are located, I'm sure that will only be a couple of weeks away and there won't be any problem along the way to come up with excellent uh, laws that are technically feasible for. You know, I'm, you know, I'm joking. I'm sorry. I'm being sarcastic <laughs> here. But but you know what I mean, right? Like we really do need to have this transparency because that is what has forced software vendors to up their game over the last 20 years, at least most of the right. big ones. Um, right. So I think I think that's a big one. And um, it sort of ties back. And this is where I think it's a problem. Part of the marketing often in the cloud is it's in the it's in the cloud. So it's more secure or it's secure. Right. And often I think businesses miss that distinction that, yes, it's more secure on the infrastructure side, but there's still a whole bunch of stuff you've got to do. And we'll come yeah. back to the shared responsibility model in a few minutes. But but speaking on the transparency, I think that vendors should be forced to 
uh, disclose these things as CVEs. I think they should be uh, uh, forced to track them and they should be more transparent because basically transparency is how you build trust. If you tell me just to trust you, but you don't tell me anything what's happening behind the scenes, I'm much less likely to trust you, right? Uh, you know, you're, you're driven by a capitalist <laughs> investment idea and you want to keep your shareholders happy. I'm just a, a normal user of your of your software, right? Um, <laughs> so I think regulation is important here to have that in place. Uh, whether we're going to see that or not, I don't know. Um, yeah. That's the, the big question, right? Are we going to see that? And I mean, you know, I don't have a crystal ball and nobody has a crystal ball that can kind of predict that, right? I mean, I'd like to think that it'll happen because I think it'd be a, a nice step forward for the industry. But yeah, there's just nothing out there today that's going to force that. So it'd be interesting to see where we go with that uh, moving forward. And you brought up an interesting point. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a, a sidebar here a little bit. And that is, you know, I... I guess I still see a little bit of this. It's a lot less than I used to see, but there's still kind of that mentality that I run into once in a while. Like, oh, I'm going to move to the cloud and it's going to be secure and it's going to be great. You know, nothing is ever going to be insecure in the cloud. <laughs> um, <laughs> to our point earlier, is it more secure than what you've got in your server room? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Is it infallible? No. And, you know, we've kind of already talked about this point a little bit, so I don't think we have to, to go into great detail here. But I guess I would just like to ask you, Paul, that is this kind of a mentality that you're continuing to see in, in your circles as well? Yeah, I mostly deal with small businesses as far as my clients go. And um, yes, in in the cases when they do think about it, they do sort of assume that it's in the cloud, so it's secure. And I have to explain, yeah, well, as you said, the infrastructure is secure, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we're responsible for and we still need to deal with. And I think there's another little distinction I want to make here, because we've talked very much about flaws and the CVS and CVEs and that. That's when there's an actual flaw in the software, right, that, that we right. want fixed. But there is also the misconfiguration side, and we'll have an example in the links below. Um, this is not Microsoft 365 related, but it is Azure related, so close enough. Um, there was a, a, um, an article a couple of weeks ago by a company called Wiz, as in W-I-Z, they're a security company, and they found this major misconfiguration. So it wasn't a flaw in the software, it was simply a misconfiguration of a shared app in Azure. And this turned out to be the thing that drives Bing, the Microsoft search engine. You might have heard of it. And uh, literally, they were able to, because the, it was misconfigured, they were able to go in and alter search results. Now, obviously, they're white hat hackers. So the only thing they did was uh, in the list of most popular soundtracks, they changed it to the uh, soundtrack of the Hackers movie from the 1980s just to show that they'd <laughs> been there, which I thought was a, a nice sort of subtle touch. But they found right. a whole bunch of other related issues to this one. And um, lots of businesses, if they haven't checked, may have their application set up because there is only one Azure AD that we're all sharing. And if you don't set it up correctly, if I can authenticate to Azure AD and you haven't set up your application correctly, you could have given me admin access to your application in the cloud. So that is definitely one worth having a quick look at if you're running any apps in the cloud. And just an example of common misconfigurations. So uh, yeah, you need to take responsibility for the bits of the cloud security that is yours to take care of. Uh, definitely. That's an interesting one. Yeah, I was reading through that after you sent it over to me and it's like, I. I can't, I I feel like I I say this more and more these days. I I feel like I'm the the dog in the coffee shop with my coffee and the coffee shop's burning down around me, you know, and I'm just <laughs> I'm just sitting here reading the CVEs and it's <laughs> it's uh it's interesting. I'll say that. <laughs> Yeah, that one, uh, that one is a doozy. I, I warmly recommend people to go and have a uh, have a read of their blog post where they talked about it. Definitely, and they got I'll a be sure to link that in the show notes. In, in a, they got a measly forty thousand in a bug bounty for it, so I thought that was a bit stingy. Uh, which I think they donated to charity, but the point still stands. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so exactly. So, yeah, we're about out of time for this particular episode. 
But I just kind of want to touch base on one last point here. And I mean, we've talked a lot about, you know, whether 365 is secure as a platform, right? And I mean, we could probably talk about this for another three or four episodes at least, right? But one thing yep. I want to circle back to is like, at the end of the day, you know, we've got this platform more secure than on-premises, right? Um, and all these different tools are available, whether you're using the inbox tools or whether you're using third-party tools like Hordit Security, there are tools available to help secure this platform, right? And ultimately, you know, I think all of the cloud vendors, not just Microsoft, but Google, AWS, Oracle, Linode, all the others, right? I'm sure there's something in their their verbiage, their their contract verbiage that says at the end of the day, it's your job, the customer, to stay safe, right? Yeah, yeah, completely. And that that is just something you have to um, wrap your head around as an IT pro if you're working in any of these businesses and you're trying to keep the whole thing secure. And and it is a it's a different mindset and a different way of thinking about how you do that configuration, how you do that analysis, and you just need to adapt and go with those times, right? right. Because it's I mean we're specifically looking at Microsoft 365 here, but in any modern business, small and medium and large, that's not the only thing they're using, right? There are tens, hundreds, thousands of other SaaS services and applications and everything else. And a lot of those are now connected with a lot of APIs and other connectors, right? Yep. And there's data flowing between them. And that gives you a much larger surface to think about. And you really do need to sit down and have a look at that. If you just assume you're going to be okay, that really is a recipe for <laughs> For waking up one morning and having a really, really bad morning. No uh, and, joke. Uh, yeah. Sure is. So, well, Paul, I want to thank you for taking the time and come talking to us today. We're going to have to have you on for a, a future episode, maybe a part two of this particular topic. We'll have to be sure to yep. talk about it. So always good to have you, my friend. And then, uh, yeah, likewise. This has been great. Definitely, definitely. And those of you watching, we really appreciate you tuning into the show. You know, if you haven't already, be sure to go ahead and give the video a like or subscribe to the podcast if you found value in this today. We love having you guys and uh, we love providing interesting content that you find useful. If you're interested in, you know, any of the Hornet security products that I mentioned today that might help you, uh, you know, take care of some of these security issues that we talked about today, you can always go out to hornetsecurity.com. Um, you know, I, I mentioned permissions manager. I'll be sure to link directly to that in the show notes. Again, assuming it's out and officially released by the time this episode uh, <laughs> is, is released. But also, you know, notable mention, you know, 365 Total Protection Enterprise Backup. It includes a whole host of security solutions for 365, as well as backup and recovery. So, well, with that, um, I want to say thank you all for watching slash listening. Uh, we enjoy having you and uh, stay safe out there. Have a good one. Bye.